Good morning and welcome to our service. If you are visiting with us, if you've clicked on the link for the first time this morning, then you're especially welcome and we would hope that you would uh, enjoy your time with us. It is with sadness that I announce uh, that two of our members have passed away. This is Wendy Bennett of One Falcon Way, passed away on Monday the 15th and then later that night, this is Joyce Reed of 37 Glenford Road, passed away as well. Our thoughts and prayers go with the families. Uh, and it is with that in mind that we pray now. Let us pray. Our gracious and heavenly Father, we thank you that you're a God who knows us, who loves us, and who cares for us. We ask now, Lord, that you would be with Wendy's children, that you would look after them, that you would take care of them, and that they would know your presence in their lives. We ask that you be with Desi and his boys, that they would also know your presence in their lives. We thank you that they were with us on Friday past. We pray for the future, for whatever it may hold for those families, for whatever it holds, Lord, help them to know that you are there with them to comfort, strengthen, and support them as only you can. Father, hear our prayers. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. The psalmist writes, Let all the earth acclaim God, sing to the glory of his name. Come and see what God has done, and let the sound of his praise be heard. We join together in prayer. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, as we bow our heads before you this morning, we are mindful of whose presence we presume to enter. Great God, you are the one who created the world and all that it contains. You are the one who created the land, the hills, the trees, the flowers and the grass. When we look around, especially in this good weather, we are amazed at what you have achieved. Father, we are humbled that you made us in your image and that you have charged us with the care of the world that you have made. Creation speaks of your glory and we lift our hearts to praise you for your goodness. Lord God, we bow our heads before you as we confess our sins. There are those things in our lives that displease you, stop us having a true relationship with you. So in the stillness this morning, we lay them before you, knowing that you will hear our prayers and that you can and you will restore us to your presence. Help us, Father, to live our lives as we live our lives, to be conscious of what you would have us do and say. Heavenly Father, we are thankful for all that you have provided since we last met. Thank you for the health and the strength and being able to worship you in this way. We thank you for the spell of weather that we have been enjoying. Look upon us now. Fill us with your holy love. Open to us the treasure of your wisdom. Encourage what you have begun in us and prompt us to ask in prayer what your Holy Spirit already desires for us. Turn your face to us. Show us your glory, for then our longing shall be satisfied and our lives complete. Our gracious and almighty God, as we continue in your presence, we ask that you would bless us with your Holy Spirit, so that our praise and our worship would be fitting and pleasing in your sight, even if it is in this virtual way. May it be, Father, that something said this morning or sung in this service, that we are drawn to you and in turn go from this way of worshipping you, better fitted to serve you in the week that lies ahead. We acknowledge that without you at the centre of our worship, our worship is meaningless. We acknowledge that without you at the centre of our lives, that they also are meaningless. So help us now as we worship to make our praise and our lives both meaningful. Lord, hear our prayers, for we ask all these things through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Uh, lots of you have been saying, why are you not letting Elizabeth read much more? So Elizabeth's coming to read to you now. Good morning, everyone. And today's reading is taken from Philippians 4, verses 4 to 9. Let us hear the word of God. 
Always be full of joy in the Lord. I say it again, rejoice. Let everyone see that you are considerate in all you do. Remember, the Lord is coming soon. Don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank him for all he has done. Then you will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything we can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and minds as you live in Christ Jesus. And now, dear brothers and sisters, one final thing. Fix your thoughts on what is true and honourable and right and pure and lovely and admirable. Think about things that are excellent and worthy of praise. Keep putting into practice all you learned and received from me, everything you heard from me and saw me do. Then the God of peace will be with you. Amen. And may God add his blessing to his word. We come to now our time of prayers for others. There are lots of things we need to be thankful for. We see people coming uh, out of ICU uh, and maybe moving into nursing homes after a period of treatment for COVID-19. We also remember all those people who, for, for a variety of reasons, have maybe been stuck in hospital uh, for, for maybe non-COVID reasons. And we pray together. Let us pray. Our gracious God, we rejoice in your blessings. And trusting in your care for all, we bring our prayers for the world. We pray for the created world, for those who rebuild things when they have been destroyed, those who fight hunger and poverty and disease. We pray for those who have the power to bring change for the better and to renew hope in the life of our world, Lord, your kingdom come. Your will be done. We pray for our country, for those who frame our laws and shape our lives. We thank you that we have our own government now looking after things. We pray that you would be in the middle of all those discussions and decisions taken. And Father, that now as we see party politics beginning to raise its head again, that we would still speak with one voice when it comes to how we move forward and how we do the best for our society. We remember those who keep the peace and administer justice. We pray for those who teach. We think especially of those children across the country who are returning to the classrooms. Lord, we ask that you would protect them. May all the, the safety measures that are put in place work, that our children will be kept safe. We pray for those who heal. We think of of all those people who are now in hospital, having stayed away during the lockdown. Lord, we know that some have stayed away too long and are now struggling with a variety of conditions, non-COVID conditions, so be near to them at this time. We pray for all who serve in the community, in the life of our land, Lord, your kingdom come and your will be done. So we pray specifically for people in need, for those in hospital, for those at home recovering, for those for whom the bitter struggle continues, for those whose lives are clouded by death or loss. And of course, this morning, Father, we think of the Bennett family and the Reed family, clouded by death, sudden death. And Lord, though we may ask why, we trust in your loving kindness that you will answer our prayers. So we pray for those who are struggling with pain or disability or discouragement or fear or by shame or rejection. In the lives of those in need, Lord, of those people whom we know personally, your kingdom come, your will be done. And this morning we pray for those in the circle of friendship all around us children and parents, brothers and sisters, friends and neighbours. And we pray for those that you have placed especially in our thoughts today. In the lives of those we love, Father, your kingdom come, your will be done. We pray for our church and its stand with the poor 
in its love for the outcast and the ashamed, in its service for the sick and the neglected, in its proclamation of the gospel in this land and in this place. We remember our new moderator and ask that you would guide him as he serves you in this way for the next year. Lord, guide all those who seek a way that leads us to return to your house and lets us worship you together as our family once again. We pray for the guidelines that have been set out, Lord, that we would uh, have the strength and the skill to work our way through them so that your family will meet once again in your house. Father, may it be as the country begins a long walk towards what we believe and what we're now calling the new normal, may your will be done, your kingdom come. Father, help us to respect each other. Do all the things that we have been advised to do to keep this virus at bay. Lord, hear our prayers, for we ask them in your Son's name. Amen. Amen. We continue in our little series on lessons from the Christian life. Uh, this morning we're going to talk about peace. I have entitled this sermon, Surviving the Setbacks and Storms of Life. This is something that we've talked about before and, and certainly in the last series when we were talking about God's comfort, we, we looked at life and some of the storms of life. And any of us who have played any of the board games that we know and love will know that the most important thing in all of that is to follow the rules, to remember the rules. Uh, and folks, that's how it is with the, the simple truth of the Christian life. 
those truths are grounded in scripture and therefore they are God's guidelines for living our lives. And these rules of life are so simple to follow, yet how often do we find ourselves in need of being reminded of them as we continue to follow and live life? The first and, and, and probably the easiest fact of life, simple truth of, Christian, of the Christian life, is that life is filled with setbacks and storms. Life is hard. Sometimes life is very hard. We need only look to two of the families in our congregation who are finding life extremely difficult after a sudden death this week. Now, whether we like it or not, we are all going to suffer. And it hurts. Of course it hurts. It's no fun. But it's all something that we're going to go through. But the other truth for us this morning, and this is fantastic, is that we can overcome all those setbacks. We can endure all those sufferings and come out the other side. We can survive life setbacks and storms. We are going to get sick. We, our lives will be hit with tragedy. There will be difficulties. There will be adversity uh, all over the, the board, the game of life. And the reason they're there is that because just as that game that we talked about a couple of weeks ago, the, the board of life, the game of life, what makes life bearable is the fact that for every one of the bad things that happen to us, then there are at least four or five other really good things that sometimes we don't see, but which make life so much more fun. There are moments when you will see the majesty of creation. There will be moments when you fall in love again and again and again. There are friendships that you will find that are so rich that you can't believe that you're that fortunate to have that good of friends. There are moments when we will have that peace and satisfaction that come upon us which far surpass anything that we have ever imagined. Life is full of good things. Today I want to focus on, on some of the things that we need to do uh, as four strategies, as it were, for surviving times of suffering in life. And the first strategy is quite simple. It is understanding. It is knowing and understanding that there will be potholes on, on your road of life, but they can be overcome. I want you to know more than that. I want you to have a clear idea about the storms and the setbacks of life. There are two phrases that we often hear that give us an idea, certainly in times of suffering, and they are, they are, everything happens for a reason and it must be God's will. There are times in our lives when that sounds okay, that that sounds fairly reasonable and we can begin to get our head around stuff like that. But I want us to dig a little deeper this morning, a little deeper into those sayings and maybe our thought process. If we're going to say that everything happens for a reason, then everything happens by God's hand because it's intended to happen and God does it for a reason, for an appointed reason. But, folks, I struggle with that. I struggle with that for, for, for a whole lot of reasons. But I struggle because that thinking breaks down when a child falls sick with cancer or a mother and her daughter or, or, or family are killed in, a, in a, a traffic accident or when a police officer dies or when something happens like we have experienced as a congregation and two families in our congregation have experienced this week of sudden death. This type of thinking led many in the Old Testament to blame the bad things that happened to us on our shoulders. It's our fault. The logic being that, that we must have sinned. You, I must have sinned in some way. Somewhere in our life. So this is God's punishment on our lives. Now, 
you and I know that that thinking is, is very much alive in today's society. Certain aspects of our, our society, that if something bad happens to us, well, you must have done something wrong. It certainly was relevant in the New Testament when we talk about Jesus and we hear about different things that he, that he encountered. But then some people take it even one step further. And they say that, well, if something bad happens to you and it's not your fault, if you haven't sinned, well, then it was because it was your mom or dad or your granny or grand or some, something really bad happened in the past that you're being punished this way. Is that really God's will? There comes a moment when you look closer and you realize that just doesn't work. For me, that doesn't work. It doesn't work because if you start thinking like that, then God becomes the monster. God becomes the monster in causing these things to happen to you. And if God's a monster then he can't be the comforter. He can't be the one that causes the problem and then comforts you because of the problem. And that doesn't work because when bad things happen, we all know that we get really angry with God, and we do. Let's not pretend it any other way. There are times in our lives when we get angry with God. It may only be a flash of anger. It may be full-blown righteous anger, but there are times when we get angry with God. And God doesn't do that. The Scripture tells us, Scripture tells us that God is a just, loving, a merciful, and kind God. And whatever God does reflects that character, reflects a loving, merciful, just, and kind God. So wherever we see God, God must be just, loving, merciful, and kind. So to say quite simply that everything happens for a reason and we therefore blame God, that doesn't work for me. Yes, all things work together for good, for those who love God, those who are called according to his purpose. But all things work together for good. God doesn't make them all happen. When we divorce God from doing the bad things, then suddenly we are released. We have a freedom to make choices of our own. Isn't that one of the first premises of the Bible? When, when God put the tree in the middle of the Garden of Eden and said to Adam and Eve, don't eat. Don't eat from it. But he still gives us the freedom of choice. Now we know that story. We know that story very well. God says don't eat. He doesn't want them to eat from the tree. But he gives them the choice. And they chose to eat the apple as it were. There's an overarching story in the Bible when we wrestle with knowing God's will yet wanting to do our own thing. How many times have we faced a situation or a circumstance when we, we really deep down know God's will? But we don't want to do that. We want to do our own thing. And so God has sent Moses and the law and the prophets and finally his own son, Jesus Christ, to save us, to save us from our sin. There's a continual cycle. And sometimes it feels a little bit like the hamster on the wheel that goes round and round and round and round and round. There's a continual cycle where God comes to save us and clean up the mess that we've made of our lives. Only for us, to get on the, the, the wheel again and the circle repeats. What God does is that he walks with us through the pain of our lives. God carries us at times through the pain and the suffering. This is why God is referred to in the Old Testament fantastic words 
God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. So the first strategy this morning to recognize that God is quite simple, that God does not cause the bad things or the tragedies to happen. He does not punish us. He doesn't use the bad things to teach us a lesson. The second strategy this morning is to turn to God and count on him, lean on him, rest in him, let him pull us through. How does God do that? Well, one of the things that, that, that it's really good if we can begin to understand is that God's primary means of working in the world is not to act supernaturally with a miracle. God's primary means of working in this world is not to act supernaturally or with a miracle. Now that doesn't mean to say that he won't or he can't. Because if he chooses, he will. And I believe we see miracles every day. I believe we see miracles in the answer to prayer when children survive things that they should not survive or people survive things that humanly doctors and nurses have given up on them. But God pulls them through. Remember when God does something in the world, I think he does it through people. I think he does it through you and me. You and I, we together are responsible for helping one another. Galatians 5 and, or Galatians 6 and 1 says this, bear one another's burdens so that they fulfill the law of Christ. So when God wants us to help him make it through the tough times, I firmly believe that he will send somebody to help us. He will send people our way. And let me ask you a question today, this morning. An important question, a question I really want you to think about. Who are the people who you will call in the middle of a crisis? Who are the people, who is the person you will call at two or three o'clock in the morning when there's a family emergency? And you need them. And you know they will not be upset. You will not, they will not think twice and they will come to your aid. Who are the people who are going to be there at a death to visit you, to be at the funeral, but not stopping there? But who will be there for you a week? A month, six months later, still there for you, still there helping you, still there taking care for you. To bring it right up to date, uh, Elizabeth and I both have ICE numbers in our phones. And I'm reliably informed that ICE stands for in case of emergency. And that I, I could be wrong, but I am told also that that the, the ambulances and the police are now will open your phone if they can and look for ICE numbers. So who's your ICE number? Who are you going to phone or who are you going to get people to phone in case of emergency? But probably more importantly this morning, whose ICE number are you? Whose ICE number are you? Who are you friendly with, close enough to, care enough about that you're the person that they'll phone at two o'clock in the morning or six o'clock in the morning or whenever they need help. If you never help someone, then I suspect no one will ever help you. Helping, caring, being there for someone is our second strategy to survive life, to survive the storms and the setbacks. God is going to pull you through. But I believe that God uses us to help our friends. 
The only way to have a friend is quite simply to be a friend. The third strategy for successfully navigating the storms of life is to have a healthy outlook. Now this is not me saying some weird and wonderful modern interpretation of positive thinking will get you through. But we need to look at what brings us joy and to pursue those things. Some people in the middle of the storm only focus, only can see the storm all around them. Only can see the circumstances that they are faced with. And that's real. Sometimes there are places where we get to that we cannot see the way forward. Never mind the way to the side. Because life surrounds us. Some people in the midst of a storm can only focus on those things that they're surrounded by. Others decide that they're not going to be a victim of the storm, but they do the things that continue to bring them joy, even in the middle of the storm. Now, I'm not going to pretend that that's easy to do. Not for one minute, because it's really, really difficult. I'm going to acknowledge the difficult things in life, but I'm also going to choose to still live to still live. Lots of people say, let things wash over the top of your head. Folks, it's not as easy as that. Those words are really easy to say. When you're in the middle of a storm, it's often the last thing you want to hear is oh, just let it roll over the top of you. It's not that easy. What happens if you're grieving? I want you to remember the good things about the person you have lost. I unashamedly say it when I take a funeral service that we need to remember the good things. At the minute the, when you're grieving and of just having lost someone, those things will make you cry. But eventually they'll make you smile. There may be a tear to shed as well, but eventually you, they will make you smile as we remember the different things about the people that we have lost. Paul tells us to give thanks in all circumstances because this is the will of God in Christ Jesus. Focus on the storms and you'll be crushed by the storms. And how many people are? Focus on the blessings and you will find joy. Let's look at the trials as opportunities to grow opportunities to make a difference in our own lives and others' lives. Romans 8 and 28 says, And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, those who have been called according to his purpose. When we do that, these become the most powerful moments for God is at work in our lives. All things work together for good for those who love God, who have been called according to his purpose. Is God at work in your life? But we are also called to move beyond that and to say, God, is there some way that you can use this to your glory? Can you use me now or in this situation to make a difference in the life of another person? I tell you that God works most powerfully through suffering because suffering focuses our minds. Like nothing else, God uses suffering to focus our minds. He doesn't inflict the suffering. He uses it to reveal himself and to help us see his presence in our lives. How many of us, through those dark times, can look back and see God and maybe only see one set of footprints in the sand, as it were, where God has simply scooped us, carried us. And lastly, the last strategy, keep the faith. Keep the faith that anchors and leads us. Second Corinthians 4 and verse 8 says, we are hard pressed on every side, but not crushed, perplexed, but not in despair, persecuted, but not abandoned, struck down, but not destroyed. 
It is written, I believe, therefore I have spoken. With that same spirit of faith, we, you and me, we, God's people, also believe and therefore also speak because we know the one who raised the Lord Jesus Christ from the dead will also raise us from the dead and present us with Jesus and to his presence. All this is for our benefit. Our benefit. So that the grace that is reaching more and more people may cause thanksgiving and overflow to the glory of God. Therefore, we will not lose heart. Will not lose heart. Though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are renewed. I remember a former minister telling me that we are continually saved because God visits us every single day. We are being renewed day by day for our light and momentary troubles and they are light and momentary. doesn't feel like that all the time but in the great scale of things they are. They are achieving for us an eternal glory that outweighs all our troubles. So fix our eyes not on what is seen, but what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. Folks, it's a matter of trust. Keep the faith. It's a matter of trusting that trusting our lives to the shepherd of our souls. It is a faith that says, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, or suffering, or struggles, or pain, or hurt, or anger, or discouragement, I will fear no evil for God, for you, God, is with us. That fabulous picture of rod and staff, comfort and strength, they comfort and protect me. God has promised to be with us always, so keep the faith. God does not do all those bad things that happen in our lives. God does not punish us like that. He does not do that. But when we look for him in those moments, most of all is because when God is most active in our lives. And reflect on that later on. Take some time over a cup of coffee or a cup of tea or whatever, just on your own in that quiet space and reflect on the rough times, the tough times in your life. And you will see that that's when God has been at work in your life. Another minister friend of mine always said that the rough times of life were the Holy Spirit digging in the roots of our lives. And those of you who are gardeners know that when you start digging in the roots of the plant, you disturb the earth. And sometimes when the earth is disturbed all around us, God is at work in our lives. God is most active and present in our lives. We have enough uh, an outlook on suffering, very much a, a, a learnt habit that says God is doing something with this. Let's change that. Let's understand that God is at work in our lives. Let's turn and say, Lord, help me to count my blessings. And savour the joy that I have each day. And finally when we rest in his arms. Knowing that the father loves us much more than we can ever believe. That's how we will survive. The setbacks and the storms of life. Understand him. Know him. Trust him. Keep the faith. Let us pray. Our gracious and almighty God, we thank you 
for all that you teach us. Father, help us to stop thinking about all those things that hurt us and keep us from you. Help us to understand what it is to know you. Help us to turn to you. Help us to be that person that helps our friend, our neighbour, our brother, our sister. Help us to look through the storm and see you. Finally, Father, help us to keep the faith that anchors and leads us. In Jesus' name, Amen. And now has become a bit of a tradition, so we'll say the benediction, the grace together. And now may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. Amen.